Welcome back, everyone. I've been waiting six months to make this introduction. I'm delighted that joining us today is Marina Gorbis, the Executive Director of the Institute for the Future. Now, you may be wondering, why are we hearing from the Institute of the Future when the theme of the Congress is the opportunity of now? I think after her, uh, her comments, you'll understand why. Following Marina, we have a really interesting conversation regarding the politics of power, a theme that we picked up last year and are carrying through uh, to, this, uh, to this year's Congress. So please join us for the entire, entirety of the program. And without further ado, I'm turning it over to Marina. Thank you, Marina, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, David. And it's so great to be here with you. Um, I wish I were there in person, but we're, by now we're probably used to having to change plans on the dime, change our assumptions about how the world works and about our own lives. So, um, you know, for many people, it's been really scary and dark times, not surprisingly. And when I think about this darkness, the one quote comes to mind to me. This is from Virginia Woolf, who said, the future is dark, which is the best thing the future can be, I think. So what, why did you say that? Why did you say that the future is dark, but this is the best thing that it can be? And I think what she was referring to is that the future is dark because we don't know what the future is going to be. But that's a good thing because it means that we can basically create the kind of future. We can imagine the future, a new future, the future we want to live in, the future that's better. So we can find our way in this darkness. And that to me really is the opportunity of now. It's an opportunity to see the world, to see the world in new ways and to find our way, maybe a new way in this darkness. Another one of my favorite writers, Arundhati Roy, says that historically pandemics have kind of broken with the past and they allowed us to reimagine the world anew. And this pandemic is no different. She talks about it being a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And we can choose through to walk through it and drag the past and drag the carcasses of the past and all of these prejudices and hatred and everything else. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage and ready to imagine another word, world and ready to fight for it. And that to me is the opportunity of the, to, of the, of the now. It's an opportunity to walk through the portal with new luggage, with new ways of doing things and reimagine this world. And this is really why we think of this as a futures moment, because to us, this is, a, this is what we do as futurists. We imagine the possibilities and plausibilities, and we think about how to get there. So what I wanna do in the few minutes that I have is to share with you some of the practices and some of the tools that we use as futurists to imagine and try to fight for this new future. So rule number one, and we always say that, that futures work is not about predicting the future. David mentioned we've been around for 53 years, actually going on our 54 year. And one of the things we learned a long time ago is that nobody can predict the future. And that is a good thing because it means that the future is not preordained. The future, we have agencies to, to shape the future. So we think in terms of possibilities and in terms of plausibilities. And that's sort of the first rule about future thinking. It gives people agency to imagine new things. And of course, arts and artists have a huge role to play in, in that process. Rule number two is we can't start thinking about the future without understanding the past. A lot of times I say that we are as much historians as we are futurists. And we have to really think before we address any kind of futures issue or start thinking about it, we go back and ask ourselves a question. How did we get here? What were the important choices and decisions that were made in the past that is resulting us in living this way? Whatever we're experiencing today 
is a result of those choices and decisions that were made decades and decades ago. You know, this is not the first pandemic that we've experienced as humanity. We've gone through many pandemics before. In fact, it's so surprising now to think about it. We think of, about this as something incredible, unimaginable, something new. A lot of people have written, and including the Institute, talked about the possibility of these global pandemics. And pandemics have a certain pattern to them. They oftentimes start as health events, but then they lead to big social and economic and political upheavals. And we're seeing this unfolding today. Um, a historian of science, a historian of pandemics, Charles Rosenberg, he talked about pandemics as a kind of drama, a drama in four acts. Act one is progressive revelation. This is when things that were covered up that we didn't want to look at, that we kind of de defined as non-important, they come rushing out and suddenly you can't ignore them. So things like here in the US are really poor shape of our public health system. Uh, things like uh, supply chains global that are very productive and very efficient, but they're really not very resilient that are being interrupted in this pandemic. So that's like act one. We've gone through this act. We've gone through a lot of progressive revelation and it's probably gonna continue. Act two is about managing randomness. We throw all these responses to what's happening. You know, hydroxy, can we take that? Mask, no mask, should we be cleaning surfaces? All these things that we're just randomly throwing to try to deal with this event, um, some successful and some not. And then we moved into act three, which is large scale public response, which is where we really understand what is going on and we, have some kind of agreement about what the response should be. I hope that we've managed to move into that. We're in act three now. And finally, act four is reckoning. This is where we have space and time to think about what just happened. Why did it happen? Who is responsible? How do we prevent this from happening again? So he talked about four acts and I would add another act, which is I think amnesia. Somehow we forget what we learned and what happened. And we moved into the space like, oh, you know, we don't have to do that. We don't have to invest in our public health system. We can, we can do better than that. And this is where I think the role of the arts and the artists, don't let us get into that fifth act. Don't get us into that amnesia state. We have to remember, we have to reckon with this. We have to make sure that we don't repeat these patterns. This is, I think, the moment and the opportunity of now. Let's not forget this. So that's um, another example of something that we keep repeating. This is a, a, a slogan from uh, San Francisco in 1918. Looks very familiar to the kind of pronouncement we're seeing today in demonstrations about anti-masking that are taking place everywhere in the world, including here um, in, in the US. So we tend to be repeating the same things over and over again. That's part of our human nature for better and worse. Um, rule number three, um, a science fiction writer, William Gibson wrote a while back that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. What he meant is that if you look carefully, there are signals and signs of the future all around us, new ways of doing things, new research findings, new patterns of people living and, and working and all kinds of things. A lot of our work as futurists is focused on that, on spotting those signals and particularly spotting like promising optimistic signals of the future. So in these dark times, I think it's, it's important for all of us. We don't have to ignore the darkness and the negative things that are around us, but we can, we have to have this sense of what we call urgent optimism. Focus on the kind of signals around us that give you hope, that give you optimism, that signal something new. So an example, a signal to us is something that's very concrete. It's something to observe. It's something that's um, maybe a piece of data. Uh, it's a new technology. It's a new pattern. So um, this may not seem like a 
very hopeful signal, but in some ways it is. You know, we've been talking about the great resignation, which is here in the US is a big topic of discussion, but also in other places, people basically reconsidering their relationship with work and deciding that work is not necessarily their primary identity or not something wage work, um, not something that maybe they should be dedicating their whole life to. Um, and, you know, there's these organizations that are being created called the NAP Ministry, which is basically giving people, particularly Black women, time to rest. And some people are gathering funds to allow Black women to take a sabbatical or to rest. But these are interesting signal of something, of our transformation of this relationship with how we think about work. This um, tweet actually garnered something like, by now, hundreds of thousands of responses when somebody said, I do not want a career, I just want to sit on a porch. And hundreds of thousands of people chimed in to say, how they would do, what would they do? What would it mean for them to sit on the porch? What would they do if they didn't have to work? And to me, this is an important signal because as we're reconfiguring our relationship with work, we're also reconfiguring our relationship with leisure and the time to ourselves. And what are we gonna do with this time if we reconsider that the primary purpose of our lives is working? What would we be spending time on? And that's another interesting thing for the performance arts community and for artists overall to think about what does a new leisure look like? What does it look like for many people? Um, another rule, rule number four is Think about these patterns. We talked about the patterns during the pandemic that keep repeating themselves, but a lot of our work is kind of uncovering these patterns. So the way I think about it is signals, are, think about waves and tides. So signals are something like waves, right? They come and go, they're small, they disappear, reappear, they signal something, but underneath it, right? There is a bigger shift. There is this tides of driving, creating those waves. And a lot of our work is thinking about these big transformations. One example of that is when we talk about work, I spend a lot of time thinking about future work and how work is being transformed. And what we're seeing, you've probably seen like explosion of independent creators using different platforms, right? So we see this transformation from one curve institutional where a lot of work and value was created through sort of formal institutions to new way of creating value, which are maybe people coming together using different platforms or being independent uh, in way and coming together and creating value in these sort of informal or non-institutional ways. And so understanding these patterns, what is then what does art look like? What is the role of artists? How do artists maintain livelihoods in, in this new world. In some ways, artists were the first signals of that because they've been living like that for a long time. So there is this new kind of solidarity between artists, I think that's possible, and other professions who've been working in a very, very different way through these formal institutions. I think there's new possibilities for conversations and collaboration around that. And finally, rule number five, it's, and in some ways that's the hardest thing for people to do because our imagination about the future is bounded by our own personal experiences. So it's hard for us to think about that things could be different. That's where history comes in. History shows us that we have created and done things in different ways over a period of time. But also in the future, it's hard for us to get, a, get ourselves out of that mindset, like this is preordained, this is impossible, and get into this space of possibilities. And again, what better place, what better profession, uh, what better venues for us to think about than the arts about these possibilities. So let me just give you an example. We oftentimes do an exercise that we call a hundred ways the future could be different. By the way, this is the space I'm in now. This is uh, on our windows. We have this um, quote 
from Jim Dater, who is a futurist, uh, who said that any useful statement about the future should at first seem to be ridiculous. And in fact, many things that we're experiencing today, probably 10, 15 years ago, seemed like they were ridiculous. So we encourage people, this is a process developed by my colleague, Jane McGonigal, that's called A Hundred Ways That the Future Can Be Different. And I encourage you to um, do this kind of exercise in your organizations, in your communities, do it yourself, do it with your families. And this is how it works. So you pick a topic and you basically on one column, you list all maybe 100 ways, uh, 100 things that are generally true about that topic, that are common wisdom, right? Like this is how the world works. Um, and then you flip those truths and you do the opposite. On the op on the another column, you basically list, you flip them and say, okay, let's imagine that it will be at the opposite of that. And then think about why would that be different? What would cause it to be different? So let me do an example from non-arts world and then try it with the arts world just to kind of uh, prototype what I would encourage you to do it on your own. So let's take shoes, right? We all have shoes and hopefully we all have shoes and we wear shoes and we're very familiar. So what are some of the basic truths about shoes? Well, shoes are not free. Usually you have to pay for them. You buy them, right? And most people probably own one, more, uh, more than one pair of shoes, right? Probably have at least two. And usually, you know, people take their shoes off when they sleep at night. Okay, so let's take this simple example and let's flip those truths. So in 10 years in the future, let's flip those facts. Shoes are free, right? Sounds ridiculous. Most people only own one pair of shoes. And many people sleep with their shoes on. And let me tell you, like, what would be explanations for these kinds of things? So imagine shoes are free. Uh, what would cause that to happen? Well, it turns out there are all kinds of smart footwear that's being developed with sensors and other things. And our gait gives us a lot of information about our health. People are able to predict possibility, for example, of Alzheimer's disease based on that. Um, you know, a lot of health companies are using, want to use that information. So just like we buy a lot of objects where the object itself is given away, printers is a good example. Printers are basically almost free, but you pay a lot for toner and ink. So imagine a situation in which we have shoes that are smart shoes that are being given away as part of your health regimen. So the data is not free. Um, then the other flip truths, 10 years from now, most people only went, own one pair of shoes. What would cause that? Well, there is a kind of a movement of, uh, for example, flight shaming where in Sweden, where people are shamed if they fly unnecessarily and uh, they incur too many miles and they use too many miles. So there's this flight shaming. So imagine a world in which consumption is being looked down on and it's sort of, you're being shamed for that. So maybe you, instead of, this is a Swedish company, this is a signal uh, in which you actually rent a shoe and then you return it and they recycle it and create a, a new, new pair of shoes based on that. So in this world, you might, be, you might own only one pair of shoes. Imagine that. And finally, many people sleep with their shoes on. This is an um, image from the time we had these giant fires in California last year. And actually police and there were... Um, announcements going out, encouraging people to sleep in, with their clothes on, including their shoes. So imagine a world in climate change where you actually do have to sleep with your shoes and your clothes on because you have to be ready to run and escape at, at short notice. Not a very positive future, but nevertheless, it's imaginable. So that's the world of shoes. And let's uh, talk about visual and performing arts today. Let me just pick three things that we think are true. Most people attend performances as leisure activity or entertainment. Artistic work, a lot of people say, say it's nice to have, but it's not really essential. 
Um, and most performers are hired by companies. They're hired, they're paid wages, right? Rather than they don't own uh, productions. So let's flip those things. Imagine a world in which actually attendance and performance arts events, it's prescribed as a medical intervention. And it's not such a uh, far out idea because there's a lot of research that shows that people who attend theatrical opera events and uh, visit museums, they actually tend to live longer. There's a WHO, World Health, Health Organization report that proves that, that participation in the arts and attendance in art events is actually good for your health. So imagine arts being a kind of a health um, intervention. 10 years from now, artwork is seen as essential. Uh, again, not such a far out. First of all, most people during this pandemic, they've been turning to arts and arts in whatever way and however we define arts as a way of surviving this very tough period. So, and not too long ago, uh, this is during the New Deal. We thought of arts and uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and during the New Deal, uh, created a work pro um, pro progress administration that funded artists to be participate in infrastructure projects that were embedded in all kinds of industries, in all kinds of venues in different cities. So art was seen as an essential part of the larger economy and larger society. And I don't see why, as people are surviving during this period, using the arts, why we can't reconceive of arts or think of arts and art performances and arts essential um, attendance as actually essential. And finally, 10 years from now, you can imagine that artists will actually own their content and own the platforms uh, on which these um, performances are done or their art is being uh, viewed or sold. Um, there is a growing movement of what we call platform co-ops where uh, people who own, who contribute to the platforms, think about Twitter, for example. Imagine if Twitter were used by people who contribute to this content. Imagine if Facebook were uh, owned by people who contribute this, their content um, and create news feeds and other kinds of things. And there is a organization called Resonate, which is that kind of a co-op. It's for musicians who also own, um, have ownership rights in this platform. So it's not that far out to imagine these very different arrangements and very different possibilities. And that's, I think, what I believe is this opportunity of now. I think in some ways, it's kind of a, if we think about it, it's, it's been a, a little bit of a gift. There's a lot of grief and a lot of darkness in this period, but it's a, a bit of a gift for us to really imagine another world and fight for it. Thank you. First of all, thank you for um, your remarks. I appreciate the fact that you started um, in the darkness with the quote by uh, Virginia Woolf, and then you really ended us on a bright and very hopeful spot. And so I'd love to, I have a ton of questions um, myself, but I do wanna make space. We have about 15 minutes together, um, and uh, I'm hoping that you will come down. There should be mics um, at the end of the aisles or mid aisle, and there are also mic runners. So if you have a question, I will be looking, and if I can't see you, because I, I can't see incredibly well, um, I'm hoping that you will um, raise your hands to be um, acknowledged. But I just want to say, um, I, I'll start the question, and then hopefully people will run to the aisles. Yes, can we agree? OK, great. So everyone's going to be running to the aisles as soon as I turn around. Um, my question for you is this, this notion, this real um, sense of imagination, reimagination that it requires. Um, to think about the future um, really requires one to be in a space where they fully feel valued, seen, you know, um, and we're in a moment now across the world where we're being triggered 
by so many different things, social unrest, the health pandemic. How do we find space? How do you think about being in a space where you can do this sort of future thinking? Um, talk a little bit about how you think about that work and how you encourage people to move from a place of challenge into that place of vision. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a really important question for us because, you know, traditionally, and being here in Silicon Valley, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you walk around here and everybody talks about the future and they have their notion and they have, have they feel empowered, right? Uh, to, to their, they feel like they're creating this future, right? Um, and I've written about it that um, that sense of like, other, too many people feel like they're living in other people's future, mm. right? And that is a huge problem because it does require a certain agency that people certain, it's a privilege, right? It has been privileged, but I, I think it's an essential thing to bring and take it outside of these official futures and what is given to us by Silicon Valley and technology and these other spaces and really engage. This is a conversation that everybody needs to be engaged in. And the more you feel that the future is thrust upon you and you don't have agency, one of the beautiful things about future thinking is that you it gives you that sense that the future is not preordained, mm. that there are things you can do. So I do think that for us as, uh, for us as futurists, for, for artists, for people who are in those positions, um, bringing more people into those conversations is absolutely essential. You know, our mission and goal has been to make futures massively public. How do you make that? And it means engaging people in communities in these conversations. It's about children and giving them set that sense of agency. It's about, but it also requires, it does require spaces and places where this can happen. And I think, you know, arts and arts venues, art performances sh can become those spaces. You know, a lot of times, and I've written about it, to me, like artists are original futurists mm. because artists have that imagination and artists illuminate the past also in different ways in different modalities. So I think this is the time to give that sense of space and place and agency to a lot more people. Thank you. You're really singing our, our language here. Paul Robeson, the great freedom fighter and song, songster, actually said that artists are the gatekeepers of truth. They're civilization's radical voice and a place to think about, to reimagine, to really expand who we want to be and who we can become by coming together. So thank you for sharing that. I see people not running to the microphones. Yes. There you go, thank you very much. We have someone coming just in one second. And if you don't mind, um, kind sir, if you would introduce yourself, um, tell us where you're coming from, and then um, offer your question. Yeah, and can I just say, fantastic keynote, Marina. I've just um, finished doing a global study of some of these same issues, and it seems to me, looking around the world, that some communities and countries are happier and more confident thinking about the future in the kind of terms you've described for whom often one set of doors may open, and some countries and communities find that much harder for whom other doors may open and some may be closed. And I wondered if, if you have that same sense, that this is, this is not a way of thinking that is equally distributed globally. And kind sir, before you enter, do you mind introducing yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Anthony Sargent, and I'm an independent consultant. Wonderful, thank you. Yes. You're absolutely right. The future is not, and thinking about the future is not evenly distributed. Absolutely. Um, and it tends to be, just in terms of happiness and kind of optimism, right, it tends to be really, you know, the countries that feel like something, they're declining in some ways, right? They're obviously less optimistic about the future. And so it colors kind of their perspective and how they think about the future. The countries where they feel like they're on the upswing, right? And the economy and in general, things are improving. They're much more optimistic and in terms of their thinking about the future. One actually correlate of that, of that sort of sense of optimism and sense of fulfillment 
is income and wealth inequality. There is no question that income and wealth inequalities by themselves, they break social ties and they decrease levels of happiness. And, you know, economic well-being is a relative thing. It's relative to how others are doing and where I stand in this economy. And so by itself, um, we need to think about inequality in a different way because it's it's a way of breaking ties it's a way of breaking social compact and so the countries that manage to kind of maintain that sense of greater sense of economic equality wealth equality racial equality they tend to do better and but you're absolutely right that that it's absolutely not evenly distributed, but it's also not evenly distributed in terms of whose voices are being heard in this conversation. And that's something that we really are working on is how do you bring this sense of, I, I, I think of futures thinking as a kind of a fundamental basic skill, right? That everybody needs to have and everybody needs to be able um, to participate in. So. It's unequally distributed globally, it's unequally distributed within societies and different parts of our societies. And unequally di in distributed within our organizations. We often think about the oh. future and think about the global perspective, but it really starts at home, right? And how are we giving voice and agency and future thinking to people inside our own organization? Exactly, yeah. right, right. Please. Thank you so much for your uh, framing of this conversation. And uh, I wanted to pose a question about the idea of what would it mean to be for the arts to be essential? And what are the assumptions that go into that vis-a-vis -vis other cultures? Thinking of some cultures where it absolutely is essential, it's not even a question. And, and you know, many of our Western cultures that, that sort of look at it, as you described, as dessert. Uh, and you don't need dessert if you're on a diet, right? So, uh, you know, I think part of the, the um, question I have really has to do with how we frame the idea of, of something being essential, and then how we think about that both short-term and long-term. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. And then just your name again. Uh, and, my and name's Rachel Cooper, and I work at the Asia Society in New York City. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. I think, again, one of the great, not great, there's nothing great about what we're living through right now, but it's interesting how we've been rethinking essential work and what is essential, right? And a lot of things that we didn't think about, you know, like delivery work, or uh, obviously medical work and nursing and all of these other care work is absolutely essential. So we're reframing that conversation. If you look at how people are managing through these times, so many more people are turning to arts uh, and various kinds of, you know, arts broadly defined whether you, it may be cooking, it may be knitting, it may be. So we know that it's absolutely essential. It's essential for people's survival. And, you know, we have data on that. We have health research on that. I think the way we reframe this conversation is, well, there are multiple ways. First of all, education. You know, we have to make arts education and parts of part of the curriculum, it's, a, it's absolutely, you know, it's, we're always cutting arts from any time you need to do save money, you know, cut budgets, arts, and, and so, so little of that happens in schools now. Um, so, you know, you, you make it essential by uh, requiring it's part of your education system. Um, you know, there are other ways um, that other countries have dealt with art as essential by supporting public support for the arts. Again, going back to the New Deal, so many great pieces of art, whether it's theater or opera or music or visual arts came out of that period. So obviously we thought that art was absolutely essential for us to get through this period. Um, and the other thing is that I think the way you make it essential is also by organizing. 
you know, arts needs to be, you know, we have tech community lobbying, organizing, do all these things. They have a sense of identity, right? Um, and there's so much art that happens in different places in different spaces where, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a unified force in some ways that speaks for the public support of the arts. And again, it's very different in different places. In some places, it's absolutely artists are being supported and venues are being supported. Um, I'm really also thinking about these new models about, of artists as owners of their productions and artists of owners of their creations. There are a lot of ways that people can be doing that if you kind of expand your definition of where art happens and what art is. So those are all parts of it. But I do think this is an opportunity this time, just because people have turned to the arts in, as a, such an essential part of their getting through this time, that this is the opportunity for to make a bigger statement about the role of the arts in our lives and in our society and the support for the arts that that we need um are there other questions thank you for that uh marina i certainly have a few oh there, is that someone in the middle there yes great oh you're just holding the mic <laughs> you're not asking a question someone's going over <laughs> someone's going over right now we have a, maybe time for this question, maybe a quick one more if we, please introduce yourself and let us know where you're coming from. Oh, good afternoon, Marina, that's a wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Joe Sol, I'm an acoustic consultant with Arup. I was very interested uh, what you were talking about, the uh, redefining of what work is and what leisure is. Mm. Um, and I, I introduced myself as an acoustic consultant, I'm also a tap dancer and a saxophonist. And I, I'm, I'm conscious that there are many people who are perhaps not performers or artists as their chosen profession, but are redefining themselves uh, or thinking about their creative endeavors outside of their, whatever their day job is, and whether we see a sort of a change in a blurring of, um, uh, between creatives and non-creatives, if you will, of uh, people that are maybe uh, not so professional, but a blurring of the lines there between professional and, and amateur, if you will. Over to you, Marina. Yeah, um, I yeah, absolutely. I agree with you that kind of blurring of the lines. In in the end, we all do something <clears throat> that sustains us. And sorry, <clears throat> it was great to hear about all your things that you're doing. Uh, I, I envy you <laughs> tap dancing and sax playing and all of these things. So yeah, I think it's it's important. It comes back to this issue of time. Like historically, if you look, we work more now, work for wages than we've ever done in history. You know, we're working more today than medieval peasants probably worked in their time. And so we've, uh, the time for these kinds of activities and leisure and festivals and all of these. This is how people spent a lot more of their time. So I think there is a kind of a possibility of um, more people reconsidering that and reconsidering what they're spending their time on and um, a lot more people engaging in those activities. But then we have to have an economic system that enables that. We don't have a social safety net that enables that you know people i'm i'm really happy to see the kind of conversations around universal basic income we have um almost over 100 mayors that are piloting universal basic income programs that's one approach there are other approaches um but it, it is encouraging to see that and i hope that as people this great resignation the other part of the great resignation is probably great engagement in the arts that's the other side of it. Well, Marina, um, speaking of time, and um, I want to say that you've been more than gracious with your time. You've given us a lot to think about. You've challenged us to sort of step outside of our sort of notion that this is our lived experience to think about something that's much, much greater. And I, like you, believe in things that I haven't seen. And I believe that we can create better futures for the arts, but for society in general. So thank you for sharing your um, remarks today with us. We appreciate you. you've gotten our um, Congress off to a great start. Thank you.
you so much. Um, please join me in thanking Marina Gobis from the Institute for the Future. Thank, thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're going to just very briefly wait to everyone to be back in their seats. And here we are in a very particular and special panel. Uh, not only because um, we're here, we're now, and this is the opportunity of be now, but also because, as you can see, we have found a very hybrid format, right? To be together. So please, let's, let's give a huge clap for everyone here on stage and engaging also digitally from er some other places <laughs> in the world. So welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidas to this um, politics of power, which is, uh, it, it throws so many questions, right? How do you contribute to equity and explanation in the assumptions that the arts are inherently good, the democratization of power, and how it can be redistributed with the arts, communities, and society? My name is Pamela Lopez. I'm here to be the moderator of this panel. I'm coming from Chile, South America, and I'll be also going to be helping some of our friends here on stage to make some translation within Spanish and English, if that's okay with everyone, uh, so we can all engage in the conversation. And just as a quick reminder of who we have in this particular and wonderful panel, I'm just gonna name yourselves, and then we're gonna have a brief time for each one of you to present, okay? Um, so first of all, I wanna say hi to Renelta Arluk. Hi, Renelta. She's engaging us, um, I guess, from Canada, right? And Renelta is uh, the Director of Indigenous Arts at the Banff Center of the Arts and Creativity. We also have Rachel Chanup, who's right here next to me. Rachel is the Director of the Office of Performing Arts plus Film in the United States. We have Junior Garcia. Hi, Junior. Cuban, but connecting from Spain. Licenciado in Theater Arts and Trevol Teatro from Cuba, but sorry, he's connecting from Madrid, right? That's your point right now, your spot, your location. And then we have Natalie Ibu, who's Artistic Director and Joint CEO in the Northern Stage Theatre at the United Kingdom. Hi, Natalie, welcome. Thank you. So, um, Natalie, maybe I should start with you to, so you can present and introduce yourself to everyone, in which projects are you right now, and then we can uh, do the same with everyone else and pop in the questions. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's so lovely to see everyone. Bear with me, I'm getting um, used to this high-tech setup. I have a newfound uh, generosity from my performing arts colleagues who have to do this every day, daily. Um, so as Pamela said, my name's Natalie Ibu. My pronouns are she, her, and I'll just do a brief audio, um, a visual description for colleagues who need it. So I'm a black woman with uh, an afro and a dress that is too large for this chair. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm the Artistic Director and Joint Chief Exec of Northern Stage, which is in Newcastle. Um, it is a regional theatre uh, venue. It is the largest producing theatre in the North East um, and presents a mixed programme of theatre, dance and comedy. And we produce theatre ourselves in co-production. Um, we are, as I said, based in the North East of England. Um, and I like to think we take our responsibility to serving a wide community really seriously and, and that community is communities it's it's plural um, but with a particular focus on audiences who have a, a diverse um taste level and um or tastes and uh who have um a, a variety of kind of um participation kind of rhythms so some people who only come to see our christmas show and those who are regulars and members um, as well as a particular focus on children and young people, uh, those from low socioeconomic backgrounds and artists based in the region. Um, previous, I've only been in post for a year, so I started in the middle of a pandemic. In fact, our last in-person ISPA was the beginning of that recruitment process, so what a time to join an organisation. Um, but previous to that, I ran Theatre for Humsey, which is a, a small black-led theatre company based in London that toured uh, nationally. And um, I like to think of that company, which was born out of a um, uh, desire for equality, I guess, and, and, and acknowledging a kind of disparity between uh, communities and who was in the UK and the stories that were being told and who was on those stages. So I like to think of it as a kind of gently activist theatre company. Um, and 
you know, this topic is particularly personal for me as a, as a black woman uh, of working class heritage, um, disabled, queer, that my existence in this sector is political, my existence in the UK is political, on this stage is political, and definitely in my organisation is political. Um, and so I have to navigate power and politics every single day for myself personally. Um, and I have, you know, I'm going to be completely honest here and it feels um, scary to, and shameful to do so in, a, in, a, um, in the company of, of performing arts professionals and cultural leaders, but I've thought about, you know, the question of the arts being inherently good. I'm wondering whether it's quite good enough and whether it's um, good enough to create change. And let's be honest, for me right now, it's about, is it good enough to save lives? Because it feels like that's where we're at. Um, and spoiler alert, mostly the answer is yes. And I have to think about my position and um, my, the privilege of influence that I have as my activism. It is the way in which I uh, try to interrupt systems. Um, it's the way that I try and uh, contribute to equality. Um, it's the way in which I try to help us all imagine um, something different and better um, and that every decision I make is a, is a kind of desire for bringing about uh, a kind of redistribution of power. Great. Thanks, Natalie. So, Renata, let's, let's hear a little bit about you and about your experience and introduction to this panel. Sounds great. Nice to see everyone. I heard such, I heard voices coming as people were coming in to sit down and I was like, oh, how nice it must be to just have casual conversation that you just talk to each other and walk at the same time. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I come to you from Treaty 7 territory here in Banff, Alberta, Canada. So Treaty 7 is home of the Stony Nakoda, the Sutton of the Dene, Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as Métis Region 3 and uh, gathering nations of uh, Tanaha and uh, and uh, Inuit um, and uh, Cree. I'm I'm really sad to not be able to join with you, but I am the director of Indigenous Arts here at Banff Centre, and I've been here for about four years. And the and the practice of Banff Centre is it's this international um, uh, institution that fosters innovation and, and specifically through the arts and, and creativity, and it's kind of a it's been so influential from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, it's, it's really fostered amazing dancers, filmmakers, uh, performing artists. And it was, uh, it was known as a sessional position up until 2016, where it became a full all year round, all arts um, uh, representing Indigenous arts. I say led uh, because it, it's led by me and, uh, and the support that I'm able to create multi-level wise. And so um, I, it's uh, it was in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I, th I know a lot of you already know what that is. But for some uh, that you don't, it, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was uh, formed by the Canadian government to bring voice to uh, Indigenous peoples that were residential school survivors, and residential schools were created uh, by the government, supported by the churches, to really erase Indigenous culture, identity, language, and family structure, and so. To be able to uh, come from that and grow through that, I think the arts has been a form of survival, uh, as as I heard earlier. And uh, and so um, being indigenous, being a child of a residential school survivor, and and having found my voice through the arts, I, it's pretty exciting to have this conversation today. And so I represent, uh, and I'm happy to be here. And yeah, Masicho Pianic. Thank you, thank you, Renelda. So then moving forward between digital and, and, and on stage, uh, Rachel, what about you? Um, Rachel from the Office Performing Arts and Film, and our mission is to leverage culture for social impact. And we're working on a project called Artist at Work that um, through the vision and grace of the Mellon Foundation has been funded and we're working in five regions. It's a workforce, cultural workforce resilience project where we're putting artists on living wage salaries with full health benefits uh, to do two things. To make the beautiful work they make in whatever practice they have, but also to be embedded in a local social impact initiative uh, to bring their artistry and creative thinking to the mission of that social service and help illuminate um, 
there and move them forward. So the way it works is we're in five regions. In each of those regions, we're working with a, six cultural hubs. We've asked those hubs to choose an artist. And the criteria is that the artist is local, the artist needs a job, and the artist, um, if they don't have a social practice already, they're interested in social practice. And all the cultural hubs are run by uh, people of color. So once those artists are selected, we put them on our payroll with our health benefits, and then they come up with a project with a local social impact initiative. And um, so we are on our way to having 52 artists on salary with health benefits. And um, we also have a fellowship program um, for fellows of color. So hopefully we can be part of the process that creates the pipeline of change. Who are the gatekeepers? Who are the curators? Who are the producers? Who are the future board members? Who are you know, the decision makers? And we just are trying to be part of the conversation where it's acknowledged that an artist is a worker with a work product that is crucial to the health of any society. So, uh, so that's what we're doing at the office. Thanks, Rachel. And last but not least, uh, Junior, tu turno para que te presentes y encantada de poder moderar tu conversación. Muchas gracias. Bueno, un abrazo a todo el mundo. Mi nombre es Junior García. Soy dramaturgo. Hasta hace poco era un dramaturgo reconocido, exitoso dentro de Cuba, con varias obras publicadas, pero todo eso cambió en los últimos meses. Hi, my name is Junior Garcia. Uh, I'm a playwright. Uh, until re very recently, I was a very successful playwright, playwright in Cuba, but that uh, changed uh, recently. En la relación entre los artistas y el poder en Cuba siempre ha estado marcada por el miedo. En 1961, el dramaturgo cubano más importante, Virgilio Piñera, se paró delante de Fidel Castro y le dijo, yo tengo miedo. Um, politics and power has always been in relationship in Cuba with an artist. In 1961, he's telling how Virgilio Piñera, uh, one of very important uh, Cuban playwright, uh, stand in front of Fidel Castro and said, I am afraid. En una ocasión, en una de mis obras, eh, llenaron el teatro de militares. Era con el objetivo de intimidarnos a, a nosotros, a los actores, eh, pero curiosamente al final de la obra los militares terminaron aplaudiendo de pie y eso eh, me hizo comprender que el teatro quizás no pueda cambiar al mundo, pero puede sacudir a una persona y con eso basta. Once I remember I was staging a play and they just fill in the theater with militars, military people, just to, so we felt threatened. But at the end of the show, uh, actually the militaries that were in the, in the audience, they stand up an applause. They give a huge applause. So then I learned that maybe, uh, perdón, ¿cuál era lo último que aprendiste la frase? Sí, que el, el teatro quizás no puede cambiar el mundo, pero puede sacudir a una persona y con eso basta. Theater might not change the world, but it can change one person and that's enough. Y bueno, en los últimos meses en la televisión era tratado como si fuera Drácula. Eh, incluso decían que había sido entrenado por la CIA para cambiar el sistema en Cuba. No he conocido jamás a alguien de la CIA. En la televisión decían que había recibido 6 millones de dólares de la CIA. Eh, si alguien en el auditorio conoce a alguien de la CIA, pregúntele dónde está mi dinero. <laughs> so he's saying in TV, um, he was actually threatened as being Drácula. And he actually was, uh, they told him that he worked at the CIA and that he received money like $6,000 for working for the CAA. So if anyone here in the room uh, knows someone from the CAA, please tell him because they own him money, <laughs> apparently. Y bueno, después de haber sido lanzado a un camión de basura, de ser llevado a la cárcel, eh, de haber sido amenazado con que recibiría 27 años de cárcel, eh, de que mi casa estuviera rodeada por 200 personas gritándome, vete de este barrio, finalmente mi esposa y yo tuvimos que salir de Cuba y venir para España. After actually being thrown into the garbage, after being incarcerated, being um, harassed and being told that I would stay in jail for 27 years and having 200 people outside of my house uh, yelling to me, please go away, I had to move away and now I'm currently living with my wife here in Spain. Y aquí estamos. Vinimos con 200 dólares en el bolsillo, una maleta, algunos libros, pero gracias a la comunidad de amigos, sobre todo de teatristas, amigos aquí en España, Hemos podido acomodarnos y, y tener esperanza. And here we are, and just with $200 in our pockets and a suitcase, 
uh, and with a lot of love from our friends and with the theater community here in Spain, we have been able to have a new fresh start. Gracias. Gracias. Wow. Gracias, Junior, for your testimony. Thanks, Junior, for providing that information to us and your testimony. Um, so let's start to speak about these issues, right? Let's start to speak about power, about uh, politics, about how we all have felt at some point that there's inequities, right, in our work. Politics of power is an important conversation to be having today because until recently, accepting the status quo has been upheld when considering colonial systems, especially in the arts. Yes, we want to be part of that change. Yes, arts is a societally conscious sector, sorry. But asking for a change and actually creating a change has been inconsistent so far. Now, with this pandemic, these voices coming together, there seems to be an actual shift happening. Um, how can we keep this momentum going? More importantly, how are we able to make systems accountable to be part of that change? What is then the new status quo? These are some of the questions that we're going to be able to share right now with our, with our peers here. So let's start, and, and, I, and I have a first question, and I'm happy to whoever wants to start answering it. It's um, what are the ways that systems can be challenged today to create space for equity within institutions, communities, and societies? What, how can we do that? So who wants to have the first word? Rachel? I will. I think that the positive about this moment is that it's been impossible to bring kind of people to the art. So the only way to go about it was bringing art to the people, so to moving outside of those structures and institutions and venues and being able to just think anew about what does access really mean? And I think so many of us have been talking for so many years about access, 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 and it's usually about price or people feeling warm and welcome in your institution. But access is really when you bring art outside and give the artists the agency to embed their work in communities. So I think that it's been the scorched earth of this pandemic has really created a moment where we can build something we want to see. Okay, giving the voice to people as some of the strategies. Any other ideas of? I guess in, in response, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I guess the kind of, um, my concern about this moment also is that from an organizational point of view, um, I need different people in the room. And my fear is that the pandemic um, has, uh, has caused a loss of those people that actually, that those are the people that we need and want have been hit, um, hit the hardest as a result of the pandemic, which is why your project is so brilliant to sort of um, recenter them. But at a time where we're having to contract I guess my provocation is how do we expand because it needs to be, I think, a conversation of more rather than less. So those rooms, that table is already contracted with the, with the kind of typical people around it. So how do we create space for new and different people and how do we protect them in this moment where survival is so difficult, you know? I don't think change is possible with the same people at the table. So how do we change the dynamic of that room? Hey, Renalta? Yeah, for sure. I, agreeing and, and really hearing uh, what's been shared so far is um, I, I really, I became more curious. I think that that's a, a big part of it is how are we becoming more curious to different ways of thinking and engaging? I think we've been allowed to think one way and do one thing and, and fit within that kind of way of thinking, the, the accepted, but now we're asked to think differently, uh, be differently and engage differently because of society, because of, you know, pandemic, because of voices coming forward that have asked for us to think differently and be more curious. And so how are systems, how, are, when we enter into a space, how is the space now different? How can we create a different way and who, and how can we listen uh, a, a bit more? And so that's, kind of been exciting to work institutionally is to change how systems work and to engage in ways of thinking that, you know, um, I always say it's not pie, it's cake, and it's layered and, and it, it feeds everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, that's really kind of 
what I ask for for myself and others is how can we be more curious to find different ways of engaging with each other. Bien, y Junior, desde tu punto de vista, ¿cómo cuestionamos cierto, los sistemas al statu quo? Junior, so from your point of view. Sí. Eh, eh, ahora que está eh, quizás de modo a volver a hablar de Matrix, con la cuarta parte de Matrix, muchas veces el sistema en Cuba es, es considerado como una especie de Matrix. Now that it's uh, trendy to speak about Matrix because of the fourth part of the saga, ah, okay. uh, you know, the system in Cuba is uh, several times considered to be a Matrix. Y yo considero que el arte es como una especie de píldora eh, roja. Nunca es una píldora azul que te mantiene dentro del sistema, sino la píldora, la píldora roja que hace que salgas, que se abran tus ojos. So I consider art to be the red pill. You know, it's never the blue pill that allows us to stay in the matrix. It's always the red pill that we have to take and, and be outsiders and go outside of that matrix. Cuando ocurre un conflicto en algún lugar del mundo, eh, lo primero que me pregunto no es qué dicen sus políticos ni qué dice la prensa. Lo primero que me pregunto es de qué están hablando sus artistas. When there is a political conflict anywhere in the world, my first question is not what is the press saying or what are politicians saying. My first question is always what are artists doing and what are artists saying about that. Porque estoy convencido de que la verdad de, de cada lugar, de cada ciudad, de cada barrio, de cada comunidad, está más cerca de la creación de sus artistas que de los discursos de sus políticos. I'm very convinced that every community, every neighborhood, every, everyone in, in, in the system is, is, is always more, um, is near the artist and not actually near to politicians. Y por eso creo que el arte es peligroso y poderoso para, para cambiar, para transformar los sistemas. That's why I think art is dangerous uh, in order to transform the systems. Gracias, Junior. I, I so agree. Artists are the messengers who are helping us make meaning of all of this. And so we need to follow the artist rather than the politicians. And uh, like, now that we're in the conversation about artists, right, which do you think or do you believe are the barriers that we have in order to do this? Because we've, we've talked a lot about several ideas, right, and about programs and, and, and getting people in the table. And also Renato spoke up for um, seeing things in a different view, but which are the complexities exactly. and which are the barriers that we are currently having in order to make this change and in order to allow to this status quo to be I, balanced? I think one of the issues is that the structure has been set up that artists are the luxury item that's the first thing to go and in any crisis, and artists are not only meant to do their work, they're meant to beg for grants to support the work. So we've already set up a structure where it's so difficult to be an artist, and an artist is the one that we're going to, you know, learn so much from, and is going to move us forward. Anyone else? Uh, Renelta, Junior, or Natalie? Challenges, barriers? Besides I mean, technology, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in some ways, uh, technology has opened up. Less, uh, lessen the barriers rather than the created. It allows people to come together and share mind, which is actually has created a lot of opportunity um, that maybe wasn't there before. Uh, I think. I think just following up with what, what Rachel is sharing is that you know we already are creating a space where artists are in a space of need rather than a space of um, of, of support and and need. And and so I think that some of those barriers are that we create the structure, then the artist comes in. But truly, the artist creates the structure and keeps building the structure, and then we all follow accordingly because we're so inspired by by what the artist does and, and creates and and reinvigorates you know it, it's proven time and time again that that happens and so i mean some of the the barriers that i would like to see come down is is that we are creating an opportunity for artists to step in and not asking artists to pitch themselves or sell themselves or share themselves rather that we see the value in the voice and the experience and and everything that they come with and then give give that opportunity and there's high risk in that because we don't know the outcome but that, uh, that we actually have the capacity to do that institutionally, company-wise. You know, we have the capacity to apply for funding that allows that space to be made. And, and maybe that's something to, to think about. Okay. Junior, anything to add? 
Mm, eh, estoy pensando en, en lo que han dicho y estoy pensando en que quizás soy el, el único varón ¿no? dentro de la mesa, eh, pero me parece que el mundo futuro y el, el mundo presente está teniendo cada vez más presencia de mujeres. Eh, mi última obra se llama Hembra y yo creo en esa sensibilidad poderosa eh, que, que puede tener el, el pensamiento femenino para cambiar el mundo en circunstancias donde parece que, que el machismo no ha sido superado para nada. Uh, I'm just thinking that I'm the only uh, man at this, at this panel and I'm just reflecting the, the fact how uh, feminism and how women are uh, changing and are being a, a space for changing the world and for making all these shifts and movements come together. I'm just thinking my, my last play was called Embra, which means like, woman, and, uh, and in that sense, I am a believer in that that's pretty much uh, one of the barriers as well, so solutions to the, to the issues of, of working it and moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and some, somehow one of you spoke about um, these outcomes, right? I think, Ronaldo, you spoke a little bit about w w there's a risk, you know? We don't know which the outcomes will be while and invigorating these conversations with artists, blah, blah, blah. Is there any risk in, in democratization of power? Uh, is it a problem? Because uh, Rachel also, also, also you spoke about the idea of access, right? And about giving, giving the power to people also as well to participate more or engage more from bottom up, right? Is there a problem with that? Some people feel threatened about uh, th this way of democratizing yes. democratizing Oh my democratizing God, I mean, the risk is huge to the people who have the power now, so. You know, I think the risk, even, uh, I think even those of us that think of ourselves as very progressive thinkers in the arts and producers and curators, we still have to acknowledge, it's so hard to acknowledge that we see the world through a certain lens, obviously, from our own experience, and to give up that power or to loosen up our, you know, tight grip on that power is totally risky, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, change is only going to come um, at a cost. It means giving up something and, and being okay with, with that. Um, and yeah. <laughs> has anyone in this panel ha has a concrete example of that, of maybe being a risk taker at some point and being, well, I know Junior has been censored, right? As, as he has told us, but, but is, is anyone, any examples you would like to share at this point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think there the examples of risk at the institutional level, it's so interesting because you have so many layers and it stops with the board. And until those boards take a risk with not even with who they hire, but with their um, ability to really accept change or when those boards change, because I work, I have the uh, kind of unique perspective, I think, of being embedded in a lot of different institutions, seven different institutions with seven different kinds of leadership and seven different boards. And you can see that there are such, uh, the boards on and some are so entrenched that it doesn't matter what anybody else down kind of the line thinks. It's just impossible to make change until someone changes the nature of those boards which are, of course, fundraising boards. So it's like the money's still talking, the money still rules. Mm -hmm. So I think the risk, there's so much risk in not changing that structure. Okay. Anyone else uh, to speak about as an example of, of you know, how, how you have felt this um, in your own organizations or in your own experiences? I've been thinking a lot about um, about how we move forward with less fear. And I think because we live in a pandemic, I think in some ways we've become either more bold or more afraid. And when, when we think about risk, it usually comes with a, a sense of fear to it. But fear, um, I always say we're here to serve, right? And I, and I, you know, there's quite a lot of colleagues that I have great conversations with about you know, we understand the role as an administrator, as a board member, as, as we get into these places where we are here to serve. And when you come from a place of service, the risk actually isn't that high. 
But when you serve self, then the risk is actually much higher and the fear is much higher. And so whenever I feel those that that hesitation or going, well, who am I really serving here? Am I serving myself or am I serving the artist or the community or or the company that I'm working with? How can I best serve? And and once I've ever, whenever I give myself permission to have that kind of perspective, I always find that the opportunities create themselves, the capacity grows and the and the risk minimizes because we're looking at service and, and community come from from that place. And so I, I feel like it's exciting that we're in a time where we get to ask ourselves, who are we serving and how can I serve best? And, and that comes from all that, and that can impact a board, you know? And, and, and so once that like mind is comes forward, then, you know, and you find each other, I, I feel like things can really change and those policies can really change and, and how we think of things can really change. And so, you know, that that's what I hope, you know, that we find each other from that perspective so that we could really create change and allow for greater risk, which ultimately is actually greater success. Thanks, Renalta. And and in this in this light of future, right? And in this positive positive reaction and speaking about outcomes. So here's a question for everyone else and, and also for you, Renalta, but I think you just answered to that. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you feel uh, when, what do you feel is the outcome once the democratization of power is achieved, you know? Which are your ho wishful thinking, hopeful desires about that? And, and where do you think we should be at? Or what, what, what's the outcome to speak about democratization of power? Hmm. Natalie? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm floundering because I, I don't know I don't know if I've given myself the luxury of imagining because the, the hustle is so real, right? Mm -hmm. It's head down, you know, each, each decision, each barrier at a time. So it's a great provocation about what, what is it all for? What does success look like for that? I don't have an answer for you, Pamela. <laughs> Junior, maybe, para ti la pregunta de si es que llegáramos a un lugar, cierto, donde hay una salida, en donde logramos esta democratización, de la conversación, de las comunidades, del poder. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que envisionas tú para ese futuro? Para, para mí eh, hay algo muy importante, que es no solo aceptar la diversidad de lo que ya existe ahora mismo, sino estar siempre abiertos a que pueda surgir algo nuevo dentro de esa diversidad. So for me it's eh, not... Sorry, wait a minute. So yeah. for me it's not only about embracing the diversity that we are currently uh, wanting to achieve with everyone but also to perdón no solo encontrar esa diversidad sino que también sino entender la posibilidad de que exista algo nuevo dentro de esa diversidad understanding the possibilities that something new can be achieved through that diversity so. mm -hmm. Entonces en resumen es como reconocer que siempre vamos a tener sistemas imperfectos y hay que estar preparado para, para ese cambio que va a surgir cuando, cuando pensemos que estamos en el mejor de los momentos posibles. There's always going to be an imperfect system. Uh, so we need to be prepared to see how we're going to how are we going to shift when that change comes and and what are we going to become after that. So. Gracias. Thank mm -hmm. you. I th I think one of the outcomes, positive outcomes is not to get art all off the stage. But to, in addition to having, you know, art on the stage and inside these insti inside theaters and all sorts of institutions, it's like leveraging the power of art to really change society, whether it's food security, whether it's mental health, whether it's opioid addiction treatment, like art can so speak to so many issues that we're dealing with that the positive outcome is not just wait for people to see it, but like have the artist activate it in the center of these issues and, and create change that way, not only on stage. Agree, right? Reframing the arts as an active participant in, participant in the social change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I've got two offers. Yes, okay. Uh, having bought some time to think about it. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think there's something about um, usefulness, which is inspired by your, by your answer, Rachel, about um, uh, purpose and, and, and service. 
Um, and I think there's something about the outside becoming the centre. Mm -hmm. I, I think that feels like success for me, that, um, that those who might sit on the periphery now are, are centred, um, both in institutions, in art, in stories, but also in society. Should we have a centre? Yeah, well, Maybe uh, what, what, but also what is the, what is the centre? Yeah. You know, it depends where you're, where you're looking, where you're positioned. Yeah. Good reflection, okay. Thanks, you and Ali. So, um, uh, Renelta, something else you want to add? I just love that. Like, what is the center and do we need a center? I, I, I just, that just was so, so great. I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. And um, there's a question um, I would like to ask every one of you because I already kind of have a hint on the answer about listening to your work and about listening of what everyone is currently engaging within your own professional careers. But I just want to throw this out and to, and to ask you, how do you see yourselves as change makers today? It's a tough one, right? I know. Junior, estamos preguntando cómo se ven ustedes mismos como un agente de cambio hoy en día, en el lugar donde están hoy. ¿Quieres partir? Eh, uf. Eh, es complicado porque eh, eh, ahora mismo en Cuba, por ejemplo, hay 14 niños presos, hay alrededor de mil presos políticos. Eh, si yo vuelvo a Cuba, como dije, voy a ir a la cárcel, obviamente. It's difficult because today in Cuba there are people being incarcerated, there are children being incarcerated, and there are more than 1,000 people incarcerated because of political reasons. Me, myself, if I go back to Cuba, I will be incarcerated. Pero, pero como decía al principio, recordando la, la frase de Virgilio Piñera delante de Fidel Castro diciendo, tengo miedo, eh, creo que lo mejor es siempre reconocer ese miedo, tratar de, de, de luchar contra él y crear las circunstancias en las que el miedo no sea quien gane al final. So, remembering the, the phrase this playwright said to Fidel Castro, I am afraid, right? I think the best thing to do is to first acknowledge that being afraid is something, and then, um, sorry, reconocer el miedo, then? Recon reconocer el miedo, sobreponerse a él, y generar condiciones para que ese miedo nunca gane. Okay, so recognizing that we're in fear, and then overpass that, and then create value so that that never comes to be a reality again. Gracias, thank you, Junior. Uh, Renalta, what about you? How do you see yourself today as a change maker? As a change maker, I'm just thinking about that and like in a, d a lot of different different ways, you know, like when you feel like you're a change maker, you're stepping into spaces that you don't have the answers to. And I and I often find myself there in, in different capacities. And I'm always grateful when I know some of the answers because I know that someone's someone's carved that path before me and I could see those steps and and see the outcomes in that and then sometimes I step forward and I'm just I'm just just free falling <laughs> it's just asking myself how so change makers is, is 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 in itself political challenges democratization of power and you know sometimes uh, I've, I have a good friend Heather Igliliorti who's a, a research chair in Concordia and uh, she's a, a curator you uh, know curator from Nunat Yavut and she said, you know, just having uh, access to the airport lounge in Air Canada is, is a form of change making. And, and I've sat in there with her before and I've looked around and I went, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, non-BIPOC people in this lounge. And so the fact that we're sitting here as two Indigenous women is change making. Uh, and so I think about when we step into spaces, when you're the only person of color, you've already made a change because you've asked people to talk to you in a way that questions how they can talk to you and how they feel to talk to you. And, and I think it's so basic, but it, it actually is a form of change making. So kudos to us for being on stage together in all these different ways, because we are already creating change. It is hard, you know, uh, I think we talked a little bit about it is, in, in previous was about loneliness and the solitary. And so how can we make change making feel less isolating would be would be really great. That would be um, something that I that I that I kind of look for now when I when we gather like this. So those are my thoughts on change making. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Natalie, what about you? 
my, my colleague's right. I, like, I don't want to be a change maker. I don't want to be the only one in the space. Um, I, and I don't think it's for me to identify as a change maker. I, I, I feel like what I try to do is be useful. What I try to do is be of service. What I try to do is provide an alternative. Um, and that has looked like big strategic projects. Like, um, so at TF in 2017, we ran a sort of strategic intervention, which was trying to buck against this idea of the racialization of risk, right? That if you are a person of color, that you're somehow risky or riskier than your kind of Caucasian counterpart. And so we brought together 30 artists of color um, at the beginning of their leadership, pro uh, leadership journey and established them as leaders. I mean, I say established, they were already leaders. I think giving themselves permission to call themselves leaders um, and being brought together as a cohort where they were no longer the minority, no longer the only person in the room, they were truly a majority. So there's like big sort of two year strategic projects or there's kind of rapid response. So my, my team at Northern Stage and the participation department were the first responders to Biker, which is a community in Newcastle of um, very low socioeconomic, very um, culturally diverse, but um, you know, registers as below average and all the sort of in indexes of, of poverty. Um, and they were the first responders delivering food parcels um, before the council were, that's change making. Um, and you know, in really tiny ways, we're we're committed to making sure that we um, advertise for creative roles. So, for so long in theatre in the UK, that you know, a director picks um, a sound designer, they pick a lighting designer. Those are jobs that you never see advertised, and so it's impossible to kind of create an interruption to who is who gets access to spaces like this. So, you know, a small decision to go, you know what, in every show we're going to advertise for a sound designer, so that we can be surprised and. Um, and we imagine what sound design looks like for our building. Um, so those are the ways in which I try to be useful and of service. But I think, you know, I aspire, like, you know, like a good charity aspires to never, not need to exist anymore, right? The problem to disappear. And I similarly sort of aspire to not be a change maker. Good aspirations, good outcomes. <laughs> Very nice. Rachel, what about you? I think that at the office, we just think of change making as looking every day, like are we doing something with all of our projects to move the ball forward, even in a small way? Because if we look at it as systems change, I think it's too overwhelming. So it's really about, okay, is everything we're working on true to, in some way, creating change in the world in a positive way? And internally, I think, is like the little old white lady who's running this company. Like, am I really listening and giving agency to all of my colleagues who come from a very different place and have very different worldviews? And I'm not just giving lip service to that. I'm really supporting them to bring their vision to the field. Fantastic. I, I have to add also that um, being good listeners, right? I think it is part of. Of, it's one of the challenges and one of the best things we can, we can make in, in terms of providing change. And I just want to thank all of you because everyone has spoke up and we have been really good listeners in different languages, through different medias, right? And, and, and being able to reconnect. And that's what we're doing here at ISPA as well, right? Being resilient to different barriers and resilient also to come together and to think about this and to speak about these ideas and to be able to share them with, with each other. I think that's very, very valuable and important. So thank you for being part of this conversation. In the what an incredible session. So many themes and issues were brought up for me and I'm sure for you as well. So this is, to coin a phrase, the opportunity of now. The opportunity for you to get together with your colleagues and talk about the sessions and discussions you've just heard. Or perhaps you just want to get together and chat or gossip or catch up. That's okay too. Some of you joined us for Coffee Clutch the other day. Those tables are still set up. And although there are discussion themes uh, still there, don't worry about it. Just talk about what you'd like. And um, just a reminder that there's 10 people limited to the table. If a table's full, just go to the next one. We've scheduled this for a half hour, but feel free to stay as long as you'd like. Pop around tables, enjoy. And remember, you can always come back and see who's at a table when there isn't something scheduled. You never know who you might run into. 
Thanks, everyone. Enjoy.